Hello, this is Kevin Zhu, the founder and author of the Interconnected newsletter on interconnected.blog, the internet's only bilingual Chinese English newsletter on an intersection of tech, investment, business, and geopolitics. Today is another narration of one of our most recent publication, which is actually a translation of Zhang Yiming's last speech. For those of you who don't know him, Zhang Yiming is the founder and ex-CEO of ByteDance, which created TikTok, Douyin, among many other popular apps. He gave this speech at ByteDance's All Hands in March 2021, and in May, he stepped down as CEO, which makes this his last speech yet. And uh, I want to do this narration because the speech was one delivered in Chinese and also there was no video or audio, I believe, of the original speech because it was a company meeting. And this is our unofficial English translation. And this reading is, of course, just my reading, not Zhang Yiming's reading of an English version of his speech. All right. With that preamble out of the way, let's get started. Introduction. Just like previous years, I would like to share with you what happened in the past year and some of my feelings about the company. These feelings come from life and work, and from communication with colleagues. First of all, a brief overview of the past year. Our overall business growth rate is still very fast, and we have made some breakthroughs in new directions. We have also done a lot of things in corporate social responsibility, including fighting against the pandemic, so this is the inaugural year of our global CSR efforts. We hope that in the new year, we can continue to refine our business and continue to consider social responsibility as one of our business goals to serve society well. Last year was a very special year. With various emergencies, including the novel coronavirus pandemic, the resulting chain reaction was very volatile, and I believe we all felt it. Many people like to say that quiet years are good years, or sui yue jing hao. But in my opinion, the world is dynamically changing at an accelerated pace. We can see a lot of news every day, and it is very noisy. Therefore, I would like to talk about the topic of ordinary mind today. In the face of a dynamically changing world, we are often anxious, worried about the future or upset about the past, and a lot of energy and time are wasted on facing volatilities. In the past, there were more discussions on methodology in the industry, and we all attached great importance to it. But I think that in such an environment, keeping an ordinary mind is something that sounds simple but important. I think people who keep an ordinary mind are more relaxed, have no internal distortions, observe things with a more nuanced perspective, and are practical and have more patience. They tend to get things done better. Most of the time, people are able to have good judgment without paranoia or distractions. There is a saying, 本自具足, which means it has always been complete and sufficient and lacking nothing. The theme of our anniversary this year is remain grounded, keep aiming high. My understanding is that these two sentences are similar in meaning. Only when the mind is smoother and more stable can it be more firmly rooted, and only then can it have the courage and imagination to do things that are more difficult to reach. When hungry, eat. When tired, sleep. When we discuss a topic, we first need to understand clearly what exactly is the topic, because the concept is generally abstract, and since it is abstract, it is easy to have deviations. The word ordinary mind is a word of Buddhist origin, and there are many such words in Chinese, such as jing jin, or dedicating oneself to refinement or progress, and xiang ru fei fei, or daydreaming. The definition of ordinary mind in the encyclopedia is to remain unbiased and not paranoid under all circumstances and in all actions. In modern psychology, there are also some explanations that basically mean doing one's best, going with the flow, and staying calm. If you search the headlines, you can also find other articles, concepts, and explanations such as let it be or let it go, common sense, intuition, and righteousness and sincerity. For example, the saying 不离日用常行内 
，直到先天未化时。Or the supreme principle is buried in one's mind. It's actually about intuition or intuitive conscience. In an internet tech circle, there is also the popular saying: "Return to the basics, seek truth through facts, and acceptance of uncertainty." If you use the most straightforward words, an ordinary mind is when hungry, eat; when tired, sleep. Everyone is ordinary. The first thing I would like to say about the ordinary mind is treat yourself with an ordinary mind. The most basic thing is to realize that everyone, including yourself, is an ordinary person. Some media want to add drama when they report on startups and people's stories, either by making the experience seem legendary. Or by dramatizing people's characters. When I used to be interviewed, people also wanted me to share twists and turns. I often said it was nothing special. In fact, most things, in my opinion, have reasons and justifications. Nothing is particularly that difficult or unusual to explain. It's really true. As our business has grown, I have gotten to know more and more people, including many very special and capable people. One of my own feelings is maybe there are some differences in knowledge and experience, but from a human point of view, we are still very similar to one another. We are all ordinary people. But there's one thing that is different. For people who achieve great things, they often maintain a very ordinary mentality. In other words, if you keep an ordinary mind, accept yourself as you are, and do well for yourself, you can often do things well. Ordinary people can do extraordinary things. Both expectations and labels are bondages. When you really care about the outcome, you are likely to play poorly. For example, when we shoot an arrow, we aim at the bullseye. But if you think I'm going to get the tenth ring, it's not easy to play well. The same is true in work and life. When we have expectations, we will move in a distorted way. And it is easy to make things complicated. I should do this and that. If you care about your own expectations or those of others, you will be more or less bound in your thinking or decision making. All kinds of labels can be psychologically burdensome. The executive label, for example, may make one embarrassed to ask a seemingly simple question. As a result, or one may not be able to experience a product as deeply as a user would. If you position yourself as a big company, you will think, "How should a big company hold its annual meeting? A big company should have an ambitious strategy and should hold a pep rally." In fact, our company emphasizes not caring about titles, because titles will let people make comparisons. The vice president should be in charge of this many people, have this form of reporting, and correspond with peers of that particular level, resulting in various forms of bondage. Or the label of young people will make you afraid to voice your ideas, suggestions, or criticisms. Labeling yourself as a front-end engineer, and you feel no need to learn about machine learning. When I was working at Kushun, Kushun is a Chinese travel tech company owned by Meituan. My engineering work was on the back end, but I got involved in the front-end issues, product problems, and sales problems as well. I think it's helpful for me not to be limited by self-imposed titles and to have all these experiences. Focus on the present. Treat the past and future with an ordinary mind. Two years ago, I heard about a best-selling book called *The Power of Now*, on open language. The book has this passage: "All negativity is caused by an accumulation of psychological time and denial of the present moment." Unease, anxiety, tension, stress, worry—all forms of fear are caused by thinking about the future. Guilt, regret, resentment, grievances, sadness, bitterness—all forms of non-forgiveness are caused by worrying about the past. This description may sound serious. I would like to give a small example from my own life. I'm not particularly disciplined in my life. I often look at my phone, listen to music, read Toutel, and browse through Douyin and Xigua. Very different from how the outside media portrays me. Sometimes at night, I will plan to do some work, but then get distracted by interesting content 
on 西瓜 and browse for a long time. Before going to bed, I will get a little pissed because the things that I planned on finishing are still undone. I would then do some work, but almost as a form of revenge. But that leads to staying up very late. I truly think sleep is very important. The next day, I will go to important meetings, feeling really tired. During these times, what you should actually do is rest. Now, I still don't have a plan to fix this problem, but at least I don't get upset when I, it happens anymore. I just go to bed right away. The power of now focuses on the fact that people spend too much time worrying about the future and obsessing about the past, but very rarely focus on the present, on what should be done, how they feel, and their judgment at the moment. When we say that the past year was a year of dynamic acceleration, many people have many different worries. Perhaps while people are worrying, time and energy have been spent. But there is a lack of attention to more important things happening in the present, or perhaps in feeling frustrated by the losses and mistakes made in the past, we miss new opportunities. Last year, when we faced challenges and crises, I always told everyone to stay calm, be patient, and overall, we did that. This is really the biggest gain from our past challenges. You can't control the outcome 100% of the time, so stay calm as much as possible. Make the right decisions. Don't rush to make decisions. Don't panic, and oftentimes you can achieve the best results this way. Some companies start their annual meeting by saying that the company is doing very well, the business is doing very well, and next year will be even better. I don't really want to stress this to people. There are always various situations in business. There will be ups and downs. Some people often ask me, "How do you deal with anxiety? Your company went up a hundred percent last year." But will it still go up 100% next year? I usually reply by saying, "Why must our company grow 100% next year?" Of course, we hope that we can grow at a high rate, but you should not let growth anxiety affect you. Now the company's business growth is indeed very strong, but we can't indulge in past achievements, nor can we linger on past mistakes. At the same time. We can have the inertial expectation that our company will definitely become something. Keep your eyes open to see your environment clearly. Understand your users, make good decisions without distractions, and the results will be what they are. There is a saying that if you treat yourself as an object, you can have a more ordinary state of mind. The same is true for a company. Now there are many external summaries of our company. I think it's called ByteDance Successology, 自己成功学 These are very problematic. I try not to read them. We should not be defined and influenced by external evaluations, but should set a higher standard for ourselves. This year, I hope that the company can slow down its mentality to some extent, to avoid the burden of short-term business metrics on the one hand. And have an open mind to imagine the future and set longer-term goals without fixed expectation on the other. It is only when there are no constraints that we can keep our imagination flowing for the longer term. From my own point of view, I will also reduce my own daily small tasks and free up more time to focus on the company culture, social responsibility, and new direction, in order to complete the OKR mentioned. In last year's all staff letter, last year we set a lot of goals, some of which, due to external challenges, were not reached. Competition is the best opposition. I've actually heard our team say more than once, "Geez, all this competition feels endless. When will it end?" I think the first point of treating competitors with an ordinary mind is to see competition as the norm. Don't try to escape the competition. It is a good thing. I don't even think that competition should be ended by doing M and A. We see a lot of companies that eliminate their rivals through M and A, becoming complacent and end up slacking off. Competitors are worthy oppositions. Competitors may have good approaches to product innovation, marketing strategies that you should learn from. Even if there is a critical media article planted by a competitor. We read it carefully instead of being angry, 
Maybe 80% of the article has problems, but 20% can give us inspiration. Then we should absorb that 20%. No one will be as serious in finding your problems as your competitors. Of course, we should also keep in mind, do not compete for the sake of competition. Sometimes after a prolonged period of competition, the only goal becomes simply beating the competitor. For example, in the Microsoft Google competition, Microsoft for so long saw defeating Google as its goal and invested heavily in search. It wasn't until a few years later that I realized that what could really impact the core business was the emerging cloud computing trend with Amazon as its rival. Why do we sometimes turn a blind eye to some opportunities? In fact, it's likely because our mindset has become unbalanced during competition, leading more toward winning the competition. Outside of competition, there may be other reasons, such as the desire for success, the expectation of going public, etc. In the case of such unordinary mindset, when there's already paranoia and discrimination, the company may lose its eyesight. All in sometimes is mental laziness. In particular, I would say, don't rely on shortcuts and use less leverage. Let me give two examples here. Many people in business will say they want to go all in and end the battle at once. I think there's a big problem with teams that just say all in. All in is sometimes a type of mental laziness. If you have thought very clearly about the strategy, then there's no problem. But my feeling is that in many cases, it's just, I don't want to think about this anymore. Let's just do it. Let's just go all in. Let's just gamble. There's another way to take shortcuts. Excessive abstraction, excessive pursuit of methodologies. My own feeling is that methodology is actually not that useful. And in most cases, may even be of little use. Because applying abstraction is equivalent to adding leverage to your thinking. But if this leverage is applied to the wrong thing, a slight deviation in abstraction can produce a massive mistake in results. In fact, this phenomenon has a counterpart called rational conceit, which also maps to human ego, because the limitation of knowledge is very obvious. A lot of knowledge is unstructured, and excessive use of abstraction concepts is actually not helpful for understanding. Avoiding excessive abstraction is also a kind of ordinary mind. I often say to colleagues in different discussions, don't rush to conclusions. Don't easily say, that's all there is to it. When we draw conclusions, we have to keep in mind other possibilities and keep an open mind. The use of increasingly abstract and advanced vocabulary is also a tendency to seek methodology. I'll read you a paragraph that I pieced together using words taken from our bi-monthly meeting materials. In the past, we mainly relied on the ability to distribute information that our recommendation technology renders, linking Douyin, Toutiao, and Xigua end-to-end, dividing into multiple products for individual research to achieve a deep co-construction and boxing combination, and to create a closed loop of content ecosystem, so as to empower customers and users to create value. In the future, we want to increase the value of different scenarios horizontally and extend our chain of services. At the same time, we should meet user needs vertically with the natural potential of different age groups to penetrate users' different ages. In addition, by strengthening infrastructure investment and a variety of position-related products, we will improve the operating value chain and establish a lasting influence on external users. Many of our important decisions do not require such complex descriptions. Many important judgments are made through observation of users and facts, and it is important to maintain empathy and an open imagination. I found some photos from the past of me doing random user interviews with our management team in Delhi, India, Qingyang, Chongqing, and Zhang Jiakou. Even earlier, we encouraged all of our employees to talk to five friends and family members while on vacation 
to see what software they use on their phones and ask them why they use it. I often find that we have counterintuitive designs in our products. I also often wonder why we make counterintuitive designs. If you don't bring in methodology and just relax and use the product, you will see that something is not quite right. Is it because we're trying too hard to prove an idea or too, or too fixated on a concept that we make mistakes on product design? Oftentimes, children can find the counterintuitive parts of a design. Why can't product managers who have read all kinds of product concept documents find them? Is it because they are too eager to validate an idea or too influenced by a dogmatic concept? I'm posting here three products that are doing very well. One is Google Earth. I often use it to learn geography. This product is great, but not profitable. Scratch, programming for children. I don't know whether it makes money or not, but it's also really great. Roblox, a kind of UGC sandbox game, which is very different from games that we usually talk about. What are the characteristics of all these products? First of all, they're very imaginative. Second, one has to be very patient and work on them for a very long time. I was thinking if our company could make a similar product. I'm not saying it's better to do things slowly. Speed is determined by the thing itself. But if the thing needs to be very imaginative, and if you've only been doing it for two years, meanwhile, there are a lot of people saying, geez, this won't work. Will these strong expectations from the outside affect our continuous investment? Don't confuse external reasons for internal ones. Don't mistake in luck for competency. One time during a discussion on business competition, I remember one team who said, our rivals are growing fast again. Let's hurry up and do something about it. I said, in the beginning, when we were lagging behind our rivals, we thought of many ways to improve, but there was no mental baggage, only bold imagination and bold actions. Now we are ahead of our rivals, but we can no longer do things with an ordinary mind. We are too afraid of failure, and our actions become deformed. I asked him, do you play games? Have you ever encountered this situation in a game that requires you to pass 100 levels when you reach the 99th level? your hands start to shake more easily because you think you've worked so hard to get to the 99th level and you must not make a mistake. Treating success and failure with an ordinary mind also includes not misattributing causes, treating external causes as internal causes, and not treating luck as ability. We should find out the reasons for success or failure. When we first did short videos, the retention of urban users was not very good. During the discussions, a colleague felt that it must be because urban white collar workers do more brain work and tend to enjoy graphic expressions and text. This logic made sense at first, but now we know that this was not the case. I'm not saying all the conclusions are incorrect. It's just important to acknowledge that there are things we don't know. People dislike uncertainty so much that they want to find attributions for both success and failure that fit the self-narrative. But I hope we could maintain more of an ordinary mind. I have a four-part series on how to deal with mistakes. The first three parts are taken from a book, which say that when you have a problem, you have a few steps you need to take. The first step is to realize it, realizing the mistake after which you can be a little less frustrated. Realizing the mistake itself is a gain. You can also correct it, fix it, which is another kind of gain. You can also learn from it, from this mistake to learn the reason behind it. The book mentions these three steps, but I later added one more. Forgive it. If you have completed the first three steps, then you should let it go. In the face of mistakes, many people emphasize the pain. But I am suggesting, do not go too long into a state of self-blame. Two years ago, there was a documentary that was very popular called Free Solo. I met the main character, Alex Honnold, when I was in California. Many people shared his story, 
But the thing that struck me the most was that it was dangerous to go forward and backward, but it was most dangerous to have a weak leg and a confused heart. In the process of rock climbing, you can't look back too much and be afraid of what's behind you, or keep thinking about a wrong step taken. Nor can you look forward and realize that there is still such a long way to go. One thing is very worth learning from Alex. He was very focused on the present moment at every moment. Free soloing is an activity with such high uncertainty that few people will ever have that experience. I myself had one of the much more ordinary but similar feelings. I used to have a hard time sticking to running or swimming. Running for two kilometers was very difficult for me. Then I was thinking, what is it that makes me unable to run? It was actually the aversion to running, that fatigue or worry that made me nervous. Later, I tried to run without thinking about anything else, except for the necessary adjustment of breathing. I tried to use only the necessary muscles, relax as much as possible, and ignore the interference of soreness. Then it became easy to run three kilometers, four kilometers. Later, I used the same method to practice swimming. Originally, I could only swim 500 meters, but now I can easily swim up to 1,000 meters. Not because my physical ability has improved, but because I feel I have removed the attrition in the middle. I stopped worrying about whether I could finish the swim, whether I was well rested yesterday, or whether I was in good shape today, and was able to run better. I really like watching videos on Douyin of sailing in the ocean. I'm not saying that people's work or life is always really difficult, like crashing ocean waves. I just want to use it as an analogy for a state of mind. No matter what challenges and difficulties there are in work or personal life, these are external. What each of us can do is, while there are always external waves, maintain an internal calm.